Shit, if they'd got me for all the shit I did, I probably wouldn't be sitting in this damn car. We'd probably be doing this interview somewhere on fucking death row. But the fact of the matter, truth of the matter, it ain't they fault. When you go into the life of crime, you declare war against the system. Now, this is back in the early 70s. The black gangsters in that period were essentially drug traffickers. You know, that's where they made their money. You know, there was so much money to be made. It was heroin, and it was heroin in, uh, they said, uh, the black community. It was estimated over 500,000 uh, drug addicts in the United States at that time, and almost half of them were in New York City. And the majority of that half was in Harlem, Bed-Stuy. There's a drug crisis in Harlem. Uh, he was a big time uh, drug dealer. I first heard about Pee Wee Kirkland when uh, he was an outstanding basketball player. Pee Wee was offered a contract to play professionally. Uh, he declined the offer because he was making much more money selling uh, drugs. When did it start? Double Life started when I was a teenager, a young teenager. Yeah, because I was playing basketball, and I was involved in life of crime as a kid. I could have became a professional player right when I left high school, but I didn't. I, I had Division One officer, but I went to a Division Three school, Norfolk State. And at Norfolk State, the first year I played, I broke every record that a four-year player could break. I was that guy living a double life. You're supposed to be a student in school, and I was a student in school, but I just was a, a, a young criminal mastermind and had enough sense to understand how to crack that code, and that's what Pee Wee Kirkman did. There was so much money to be made from drugs, you know, his first deal, right? Uh, when he went to the mob, as the story goes, with uh, $300,000 worth of jewelry, and uh, they paid him in heroin, right? because there was so much heroin. And, uh, you know, he, he sold it on the street for $900,000, which, you know, you don't, you can do the math, right? He never personally sold drugs. He was the money man. He was AKA the Bank of Harlem. So the guys that wanted to sell bricks of, of, of cocaine or heroin in that time, it was particularly heroin, they would come to him and say, Pee Wee, I need 100,000. Pee Wee, I need 30,000. So he would give them the money, they would buy the drugs, and in 30 days, they would give them 150 back. Sort of like Wall Street, a Wall Street investment banker. That's what Pee Wee Kirkland was. It's just what we was dealing with was on the other side of reality, which was insanity. Certain parts of the country, they were doing LSD. They used to call those kitty drugs in Harlem. Harlem, they like the, uh, I call them the organic drugs. They like the natural heroin, cocaine, crack. You could see it mushrooming before your eyes. So many of the guys that I grew up with, either I stepped over them from an OD or from some act of violence. A lot of white kids came into that area. It was like a supermarket. They went, bought their drugs, they shot it up, and then they left. I remember one of the cops saying to um, one of the sellers out there, do you know who we are? Yes, but if you're not here to buy drugs, get the fuck off the corner. There's two sides of Pee Wee Kirkland. There always was. I've, I've heard everything and from him going down to the Bowery where the homeless people would be uh, hanging out, and he would literally stand out there and give out $100 bills they, they would run out of homeless people to give the bills to before he ran out of money. Just had a guy that worked for me, and his job was to make sure that nobody in Harlem had a problem. And I think from that moment on, everybody in Harlem kind of saw me different. He had financial problems. He heard about it. He would leave, give them the money, they, and they wouldn't even know where it came from. Somebody else would give the person the money, and, and they wouldn't know how they got that. So yeah, Pee Wee said, go take care of it. Take care of your family. He really cared about people. He felt like, if I'm this blessed and I have all of this ab ab abundance of, of cash, of cars, jewelry, you know, homes, then why not share it? Pee Wee had a, 
a, a direct path to the legitimate life that he could have followed, you know, if he would have uh, probably uh, been smarter about it. You know, he had, a, he had a basketball career. He had something going for him. And, uh, you know, he could have played pro basketball. Uh, he's, he's been basically labeled the godfather of the Rucker tournament. You had the greatest basketball players in the country coming to Rutgers. They did things that uh, the Harlem Globetrotters would uh, envy. People was doing 360 dunks, but they never saw somebody do a 360 jump shot up at Rucker to win a game until Peary Curtin did it. But the Rucker tournament at one time had the reputation of also being a, a, a hustler's venue. You know, there was big money being bet on those on those games. If you were a basketball player, whether you were pro, whether you were street, you went there to test your skills, right? Oh yeah, one game he came to Rolls Royce. It's like the minute he stepped into the park, you could see the electricity of the fans. Like, oh man, Pee Wee's here. Look what he just got out of. He got out of a Rolls Royce. Pee Wee's probably one of the best that ever did it, on the court and off the court. Because he was not a dumb, he was very smart, very educated. He had good common sense. He just, he just, when he turned down the pro contract, I think he let a lot of people down when he did that with the Bulls. They respected him prior to go to the NBA, which they did never happen. He was good, but he wasn't outstanding. I mean, he was drafted in the 13th round, right? The story is that uh, he went to the Chicago Bulls. He didn't want to play second fiddle. That's the story I heard. That was the reputation he had. That's that. You know what I'm saying? The Harlem thing coming out of you, you know? Like, sec I'll take second seat to nobody. I think the contract they offered him was like $40,000. You know, he said, hell, I'm not, I'm not gonna take a pay cut, so to speak, right? But that's the kind of personality Pee Wee had. I, I carry that around the trunk of my car. That, that, that money is not no contract. Well, he was in Boston, evidently. And it was a drug deal. The authorities said he was at this at this scene. And so that gave him a chance to bust him. Instead of going to Chicago Bulls, I went to Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary with a 15-year sentence. And uh, he should have served 10 years, but he got out for four. I don't know if he was still in, um, in loan sharking or not. So he still had a lot of money when he went away to prison the first time. And of course, they were, they were uh, investigating him, right? They didn't stop uh, because they were very suspicious about all this money that, that, that they couldn't find. Essentially, it was from all the money he made before. You know, he couldn't hide it. I didn't know he was putting the case together. They knew they was putting the case together. So I just came back to New York, back to Harlem. You, would you, you ask me if I ever went back into the drug game? No. So if you're, if you're driving around with a Rolls Royce and a variety of other cars, you know, cops are going to be, you know, kind of wondering where, 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 where was this kid getting his uh, money from, you know? And they come with the tax case to try to get the money they couldn't recover in the first case. That's because they had no evidence, couldn't create no evidence, and couldn't make nothing right in the case. So they come up with net worth. And then I'm getting 10 years for that. And when the judge asked me in court, how did I feel? I told the judge I felt good. And that was that. This is a man that when the feds came to get him, they said he had $33 million in net worth. That's what they knew about. If they knew what I knew, shit. Man, listen, he was way ahead of what they was, were talking about. The rest of it, the government, the federal government is trying to find out. They've been trying to find that out for maybe since I was about 16. So if you figure that out, you could tell them. Because death before dishonor means I'd rather give my life and die. That means whatever I know about that reality you're talking about is going to the grave. You know, he was arrested uh, not paying his taxes. He was money laundering. And his, his mother was implicated in that too, you know, which was, which was kind, of, kind of sad. No, I don't want to go there with my parents. Tell you where I go with my parents. You want to find out something about my parents? I said, they can't get me out and make it in my mother's fault. And I'm telling you, you can't do the same thing. So that question, you don't need to ask. Because everything Pee Wee Kirkland did, I did. Every decision I made to be in the life of crime, I made it. And when the consequence came, I dealt with it. No, we're going we're to say that we're going to go into more detail. 
No, you're not. This is you talking. You ain't going into more detail. Well, you're going to go into more detail. No, I'm not going into more detail. We could talk more about my life. We ain't going to talk about the same thing. You got it, man. Stop probing because you're driving yourself crazy. He, yeah, you keep searching and searching and searching and searching. He takes stock of his life. He realizes that he had screwed up, and so he decides that he's going to um, uh, go back into society and be a productive citizen. Now you're seeing when he came out of prison in 87, when he decided to turn his life around, he applied himself. Pee Wee Kirkland, uh, I had never really known much about him, but a local minister called me and said, there is the most incredible, charismatic figure I have ever seen with children in my life. I went over to the local uh, church and I watched him. And there was a magical man, a great teacher. Anybody that can inspire like that, I want to have teach at my school. He paid his debts. And my belief is that human beings are on a scale, which is balanced between good and bad. You know, and ultimately, you know, he went from the bad to the good, but he was high on the good. American love comebacks, right? His story is one of the great comebacks. I mean, he came back. You know what I mean? There's only so long a person can pay for his, his sins before you have to forgive him. And I think that's the case with, uh, with Pee Wee. His whole life was spent basically being a ball player. And he loved basketball. That's why today he got the school of skills teaching kids giving back. They feel my pain, I feel their pain, and we both feel each other's love. Kirtland is giving back by, by mentoring some kids to play basketball. They can learn to play basketball on their own. That's how he learned. He either screwed up their grandparents or their parents because they were the ones buying the drugs that he was pumping out there at the time. Doing the wrong thing. It's like that old expression. Keep doing the same shit, expecting different results. No, shit is shit. It's going to smell like shit. And it ain't going to change. Trust me. They say it's not how your life begins. It's how your life ends. And in that regard, I'm kind of happy and glad that I'm the period curtain that I am. <laughs>